Well, it's good to be back seeing you all today. Uh, Charlotte, as you know, is going back and forth to Houston a lot. We, we know she's in good hands, and she's going to be back with us next Sunday. And then the Sunday after that, you've got to put up with me again, so I'll be praying for you. But it's good to be here, and preparing a sermon uh, is an interesting endeavor, and I'm going to do something I usually don't do, which is to preach a sermon that starts off with what we call in the technical lingo an expository sermon. Expository preaching is a, is a sermon that deals with the text itself as it stands. Uh, it dives into the history of those texts, how it was produced, the linguistics, the translations, and it, at the end, it often goes a little bit, and this preacher will wrap it up and say, now this is what this means. Um, that style of preaching is tough. It's tough for me to do, uh, because I don't consider myself a scholar. Uh, it is tough for the audience sometimes, because they don't really understand what's the purpose of all this. So, um, But I think these two passages today, taken together, one from Paul, one from the gospel reading itself, together they stand as a testimony or a witness as to what it means to really be fully human and what it means to try to follow in the footsteps of this person who suffered and died on the cross. So there are two foundational texts. And as Charlotte reminded us a few weeks ago when she talked about this time we live in, she reminded us all that we live in, in the church calendar. This is called ordinary time. It's the time between Advent, of hoping, of Christmas, of deliverance. Ordinary time then follows for a pretty good long period of time, followed by Lent, and followed by Easter. So this gap between the birth and appearance of the Christ child and the death of Jesus is where we live. That's kind of, we call it ordinary time, but it's really just, just it can be mundane time. But yet, that's the power of where Jesus lived. And I, I felt that so intensely a few years ago when I went on a trip to the Holy Land and the geography of the place really spoke to me. It, it took the text out of a sterile academic environment and said, you know, this, this powerful stuff happened here in this walk in this desert, in this mountain. And so ordinary time is really not very ordinary because I don't think my time's very ordinary. It, it seems blessed and gifted and sad at times and broken at times. So I think to really understand these texts and understand ordinary time, I want to spend just a little bit on these uh, time on the texts themselves because they're fascinating because I would submit that it took a thousand years of reflection by the body of Christ to fully understand these texts. The early church, I think, missed the boat. Or maybe they had the boat and we missed what happened. I'm not sure. But I want to talk a little bit about two characters from around 1100 A.D., one is Anselm. You probably hadn't heard of him, but he was a philosopher, a theologian. And he struggled with this notion of what happened at the cross. Was this just some kind of cosmic mistake? And why did it have to happen this way? He developed a, th a theory that was called the transactional model or the objectivist theory that Jesus' suffering and death was simply a ransom that had to be paid to a vengeful God for how messed up we human beings are. That that death and suffering was a payment for our sins. And that, was, that notion of a sacrificial offering, you have to understand, was deeply embedded in Middle Eastern culture. Not only the Jewish people, but the Babylonian people. There were animal sacrifices. Even Abraham was challenged to sacrifice his own son. So this notion of a sacrifice to appease God and somehow pay the cost for our sins became deeply embedded in Christianity around 1100. But it took a thousand years for that transactional, sacrificial model to evolve. It's a 
I had problems with that when I first read about it. It's uh, I thought, what kind of God would sacrifice his own son for somebody else's sins? I wouldn't do that as a father. Most of us wouldn't do that for our children. Well, about the same time that Abelard was working through this and getting control of the church, another character shows up on the stage named Peter Abelard. Abelard I can relate to. He's pretty human. Wasn't as theoretical as Anselm, but he developed a, a theory of the cross and suffering that people have called the subjective model. And he says the subjective reason that this happened was not to pay some kind of debt, not to turn God's suffering into a payment for our messed up lives. The reason that God allowed Jesus to die was to act as a witness for love. So it wasn't a payment. It was inspiring us to sacrifice for others. That's a very, very different model than Anselm. And as far as we know, the two never bet, met, but they duked it out like Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow would. <coughs> They're very different understandings of a singular event in human history, and that's the life and death of Jesus Christ. Abelard really, I think, had an insight that we need to reconnect with. That this, whatever happened in the life of, and death of Jesus, it was not only for atonement, but it was to show us how we live with each other, how we love our neighbors as ourselves, how we listen to the voice of the Spirit when we engage a world that is in need of redemption and of healing and of salvation from our own brokenness. I remember reading a book when I was in high school and in college. The movie came out, The Last Temptation of Christ by Nikos Kotsantzakos. Kotsantzakos was a Greek writer, a poet, a philosopher from the island of Crete. Uh, I've been to the museum honoring his life. It's fascinating. And he wrote a book called The Last Temptation of Christ that was made into a movie by Martin Scorsese, one of his early films. And I remember watching that movie, and the movie struggles with this very notion of two things. One is, at what point in Jesus' life did he become aware of his destiny, of his origins? Was that onset of what I called God consciousness a gradual awakening? You know, we forget that Jesus was a teenager. He was a 16-year-old like all of us, and 16-year-olds are useless. I mean, they... You know, <laughs> they yeah, you need to be, you know, they're not fully formed humans yet. <laughs> and, but Jesus went through that. And he didn't woke up and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm God's son. He'd have been laughed out of his house and slapped upside the head and kicked out of the synagogue. But at some point, he began to see that he had a relationship with the Father that was unique and that was calling him to do something different. To preach a gospel, a gospel means good news, to preach good news to a broken world that was intent on seeing everything as a transaction. And how, uh, how Jesus, I mean, Katsantzaka struggles with this, the, the, what that struggle within Jesus' own identity eventually leads him to do is to realize that crucifixion was necessary. He couldn't avoid it. It was not only his destiny, but it was a way he could live and show the love of God to people that were broken, that were needy, where we all live. Katsantzakis' work got banned by the Catholic Church, like Abelard's work did. He got banned, he was labeled a heretic. But I think there's something in the way these two people understood the necessity of Jesus' life and death. So how does this play out in today's culture? You know, one of the great themes in today's culture, I think you've heard about it from this pulpit before, is what I would loosely call the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel means that if you just believe good things are going to come your way and you're not going to have bad things happen. Well, I've never known that to be true. 
I've seen bad things happen to good people for 50 years in medicine. I've seen people survive that, and I've seen people die from that, from tragedy. So the question isn't how we dodge that bullet. The question is how do we live with that reality? And what Abelard's gospel says is that humans can flourish, can be all that we're called to be, when we love and serve each other. It's that simple. It's not, it's not a hard gospel, really. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I was talking uh, earlier with uh, a parishioner, wrote a great book called The Cost of Discipleship. And, and he, he wrote this from the prison camp as he was awaiting execution by the Nazis. And the cost, we think, has to, sometimes we think it has to be a big cost, like the loss of our lives, but it's the small daily costs where most of us live, right? We're called not to do the big things, but to do the little things. And the Greek word for this in Paul's letter to the Philippians is kenosis. And I think I may have mentioned this word one time before. Kenosis is a fantastic word in Greek. And it really means emptying yourself out as a sacrifice. So his image of this sacrificial notion of Jesus on the cross plays out in the Greek translation of the word kenosis. Kenosis, uh, the best way I can give you an image of this that I've used when I was teaching at, at Baylor in, in the medical school, you get two, two boxes on a chart. We're the two boxes. We're empty or we're filled with something. And if we empty ourselves to the other box next to us, we empty ourselves out again, and we empty ourselves out again, and we empty ourselves out again. What happens? If those are boxes of water and you took high school physics, you'd say, well, one box of water gets too full, it overflows, and the other box of water becomes empty, right? What Paul is calling us to realize is that in the emptiness, we have the capacity to fill ourselves back up again. And that's the paradoxical, mystical, beautiful nature of the gospel. That is only by giving a piece of ourselves away that we can be full again. And that doesn't have to be a big giving away. You know, we, we live in this transactional world. Our po politicians are the worst. They tell us, well, everything's a, a transaction. It's just a matter of negotiating the terms of the contract. But throughout for 2,000 years, people have told us, mystics have told us, Jesus has told us, that the only way to be fully human is to give a piece of yourself away. Some people find that intimidating. I find it liberating. I find it joy-giving and life-affirming that we can give ourselves away all the time, day after day, and still survive, <laughs> you know, still make it. It doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. It just means we'll be given the inner strength and the inner reserve to live fully with joy. I heard a lecture a few years ago by the dean of the new medical school at University of Texas in Austin. And he was talking about the foundational pillars of medical education. And there, there were three of them that for 100 years that that medical schools have emphasized. But the Dell Medical School wanted to try something different. They wanted to include the word joy in everything they did from day one. They wanted to build a culture where the doctors that were continually giving themselves away could somehow find joy to survive that loss. And I thought that was a brave thing for a medical school in this day and time to, to build a culture surrounded of joy. Baylor University's basketball coach, a dear man, dear friend of mine, Scott Drew, he recruits players who want joy. Jesus, others, yourself, in that order. He built players who developed a passion for teamwork, for selflessness instead of selfishness, and he won a na national championship 
building on the model of serving others, making the pass instead of scoring. Those are good metaphors for all of us as we think about what it means to give away a piece of yourself. So I'd like to close first with a few questions and finally with a story. So the questions we all have to face are, number one, what do we give ourselves? What, do we, what piece of ourselves do we die to? What piece of ourselves can we live without? The second question that follows is, what do we fill ourselves back up with? That's the, that's the big question, right? We're always giving away. What do we put back in the tank? Do we put high octane or low octane? We, we give ourselves away, we better fill it back up with something. How do we live into the paradox of self-emptying? Does, does emptying yourself give your power away or does it, does it make you stronger? Paul says over and over again, it makes you stronger. The world doesn't like that. The world doesn't like giving power away. That just Bonhoeffer asks us, what is the cost of this? What kind of crosses do we face with our own death and resurrection? How do we flourish as a community, as a body of Christ, as a church at Snowmass Chapel? as a friends, a circle of friends that gather once a week. I think giving ourselves away allows us to do two things. It allows us to move closer to God, and it allows us to move closer to people. There's a great image from the Middle Ages of a feminist theologian, there were those in the Middle Ages, of a wagon wheel with the spoke, circle of the rim of the wagon wheel, the spokes at the center of the wagon wheel is God. We're out on the rim, and the spokes are the path we take, right? So when you see, see the wagon wheel, as you move closer to God, from the rim down towards the hub, you're also moving closer to your neighbor. That's the geometry of a wagon wheel. If you want to get closer to your neighbor, you're not allowed to jump the distance. You have to move closer to him or her. By doing that, you get closer to God. That's the way the magic works. I close with a story that has been foundational to me as I've struggled through this latter part of my career in, in medicine and teaching about giving yourself away. And I think it relates both to this notion of kenosis that Paul talks about as well as to this notion of the cost of dying to yourself. About 50 years ago, I was an intern and was assigned a case uh, that changed my life. She was the wife of the dean of the dental school. She had a fatal form of heart disease that we were just beginning to recognize, and she was my patient. And her children were roughly our age, my wife and mine's age. And during those six months, I broke every rule in the book, which was don't get close to your patients. You can't be objective if you're always getting too close to the emotional content of, it, of this. And this was headed towards a tragedy. We knew it. It was inevitable. And six months after her diagnosis, after I had become good friends with the family, we had shared a meal together, we had prayed together, we had laughed together, we had cried together, my patient died just like I knew she would. And my professor of cardiology, a Jewish genius whose family had perished at Auschwitz, said, Mike, you need to go to her autopsy. We need her heart for the research we were doing into her diagnosis. And I said, well, please don't ask me to do that. I went, and I held this woman's heart in my hands that I had cared for and broken bread with and prayed with. And we wrote the paper. We remained friends for the rest of my time in my training program, and I went into cardiology because of her and her death. And after we moved from Kentucky, I kind of lost track with the family. Life happens. Things happen. Life moves on. 
And two months ago, the daughter of my patient, who was daughter was 19 at the time, reached out to me. Hadn't heard her from her in 50 years. She looked me up on Google, reached out to me. We reconnected this wonderful friendship with her and her husband and her two brothers that we all hung out with when we were young and foolishly uh, involved with this life we, we thought was going to be perfect. And we've had this wonderful reconnection. And she told me once in, in one of these exchanges we've had, she said, I don't understand how you had the time to take care of me while you were taking care of your mother, my mother. She said, I was falling apart, and you're the only one who would ever stop and ask me, how are you doing? So giving yourself away doesn't mean you close the door to growth or to compassion or to healing. I think it opens the door for us to grow into who Christ is calling us to be. This notion of service, whether it's in medicine or teaching or consulting or whatever it is you do, to do it well, you've got to be willing to take those risks to give a little piece of yourself away. But I can tell you from this one experience that my patient shared with me and her family now 50 years later, is that that's what makes it work. work. I would submit that kenosis and the joy that it brings is the antidote to despair. It's the way we're given the strength to get up in the morning and face the mystery of a world that continues to baffle us and wound us and give us joy and give us meaning. And we don't like that notion. We're, we're trained to avoid pain. And I think that Paul would tell us and Jesus has showed us that dying those little deaths to ourselves are what allows us to get a glimpse, however small it may be, into the living, breathing, infinitely beautiful kingdom of God around us here every day in the chapel. Amen.